According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, in the U.S. alone, 17 homicides were committed in 2018 by white nationalists. But the rise of this type of violence is not unique to this country. The same organization identified a hate crimes increase in Western Europe over nationalism, immigration, and class. And here to discuss the rise of extremism and give his perspective on the tragedies that took place this weekend is Michael Brooks, host of The Michael Brooks Show. He joins us now via Skype. Good to see you this morning, sir. Good to see you guys. First of all, what's your reaction to the events of this past weekend and also the uptick in white nationalist violence that we've seen recently? Well, I mean, one, it's really clear, right, that what's so disturbing in some respects is that it isn't something at all, that these events have definitely become more and more pretty significant extent. Um, and I think, you know, the broader reaction is that we need to deal with both all of the dimensions there's an ideological dimension, and there's also the tradition that leads to the growth uh, of these really parasitic ideas. Um, and in some ways, you know, there is a lot of analogy that should be drawn, obviously, with Al Qaeda and ISIS, no doubt. But part of the analogy is that the securitized response is wrong uh, and not strategic. So somehow we need to be real about what we're dealing with it's white supremacist terrorism. We need to be real that it, it flows from the highest reaches of government. Uh, it gets at the very least winked at uh, by Donald Trump and other uh, And then we need to go about figuring out how to address the conditions of alienation, lack of purpose, lack of meaning, and of course the overall failure of globalization and economic environment, uh, along with the specific targeting to actually disrupt uh, cells. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Michael. I think that, that really is the right way to look at it, which is both you need an entire whole of government, FBI, dramatic response, the same way that, w that we dealt with ISIS. I talked about this yesterday. And you're right, I mean, we also have to acknowledge that there's these globalization factors which have caused large unrest, and it's actually incumbent on the government to deal with some of these underlying things. It was very easy to understand with Islamic terrorism, and it shouldn't be that difficult to understand with white nationalist terrorism. One thing I also do want to get you on is I know you're very interested in what's going on in Brazil, particularly uh, with the crackdown on, on journalist uh, Glenn Greenwald. I would love to get your perspective on that. Well, what's happening in Brazil is really a microcosm of all of the problems we're talking about. And you know, you have a political prisoner in Brazil, Lula da Silva, who served as Brazil's president for two terms, who I think by any metric having to do with caring about people has been the most successful president of the 21st century so far. He lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty. He came from an incredibly impoverished background himself and is a serious strategic visionary, but also down to earth, plain spoken and incredibly charismatic leader. He was put in jail on uh, political charges. They trumped up. Glenn Greenwald's reporting has revealed that. And therefore, the judge put Lula in jail, who's now Bolsonaro's justice minister, along with the Bolsonaro government, are targeting Glenn. And certainly, Bolsonaro is at the center of a global far right of you know, fascism. I just want to circle back you know, briefly. I, I have a lot of criticism of how we dealt with ISIS and, and Al Qaeda. I don't want to say, you know, a securitized response. And I certainly don't want you know, checkpoints and mass surveillance in the United States. I just think an integral understanding that just because we understand the conditions of why something arises does not mean we're justifying it in a second, whether yeah. or not ISIS murder or white supremacy. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. I mean, any one individual bears the full responsibility of their ugly and abhorrent behavior. But when you see, a, I mean, not just a national trend, but a, a transnational, almost global trend, you have to ask what's going on there. We've been very strong here. Uh, I've been very strong in criticizing the president's language, his approach, his inflaming of these sentiments. But I think you have to go back further and look at the roots and look at the fact that we had a, a bipartisan consensus here in this country around basically profit maximization over humanity. And we are at a place now where, because of that hollowing out of our country, you have so much alienation, you have so much essential despair 
in a wealthy country where it's really just unnecessary. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we're doing this conversation too is thinking about those root causes and not just saying, oh, it's all Trump's fault, but looking beyond that because the, the forces that brought us to this place were in, were in position long before Trump came along. Well, I think Trump is a symptom himself of all of these problems, right? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a disgusting image, but I think it works so well. One of my mentors, Bill Fletcher Jr., he says, uh, right, and forgive me, right-wing populism is the herpes of capitalism. <laughs> and when you don't deal with the underlying conditions, and again, that's a broad set of conditions, right? So we already know that, of course, poor people, people of color, industrial workers, They've been hollowed out for decades, by policies. And, and of course, a lot of, you know, plenty of people have been on the receiving end of these policies have not turned to terrorism or other toxic ideologies. But it also includes a lack of purpose, a, a general sense of dislocation and alienation. When you combine that with the fact that we've never reckoned with our history and our politics of you know, an institutional racism and a structural racism that changes depending on the economy, it changes depending on geography, but it's always there from the inception of this country. When you fuse those things together, you have a terrible situation. And in some respects, you see some similar dynamics in Brazil. I mean, Lula himself was like, you can't disconnect what's happened even with the coup against the Workers' Party to the fact that Brazil really ended slavery, you know, very short time ago, right? Like we're still living out these things and we have to deal with all of these causes simultaneously. But you know, one of my concerns again about securitization and not dealing with the causes is that some of the discourse then just sort of becomes, you know, there's new populations to police, new situations to sort of surveil. I want less of that in general across the board so we can actually deal with problems and create some human flourishing. I think I think that's a really interesting point, Michael. I, I also I'm also curious what your view is, generally on how on the the online environment plays in this. Obviously, you operate in that space. I operate. You know, we operate in that space. There seems to be an effort in order to link some of this violence to you know maybe YouTube or or you know 8chan in particular is where all of this had the genesis. How should we go about, I guess, policing or viewing these, these online platforms whenever there's, some of them are directly tied to hate? I think the big picture about these online platforms is that there needs to be, whether you want to take an anti-monopoly approach of a progressive approach, or if you're like me, you have more of a socialized idea, which is that some of these things need to be treated as public utilities. Uh -huh. um, there needs to be a way to ensure free speech an open argument while at the same time obviously dealing with these grotesque ecosystems that have evolved. And I don't have all the answers to it, but I do know that whatever the scenario, you cannot put trust in the hands of these tech monopoly companies because frankly, they initially helped the rise of all of this hate on places like YouTube through the algorithms and through doing nothing about the proliferation of that content. And now, you know, on the other hand, they may overcorrect in such a way as to suppress really just independent journalism and redirect the internet into a new you know, media monoculture. And both of those approaches obviously don't work. I don't have all of the answers, I don't think anybody does, but I know that these environments are media environments, they're not neutral platforms, uh, and that the companies that run them need to be structurally interrogated. You know, I don't mean some silly Republican hearing of like, you know, people on Facebook or mean to diamond and silk or any of that nonsense. I'm talking actual policy. Yeah, because all of these tech platforms essentially profit from sensationalism. I mean, that's, that's what they do. And so that propagation of extreme views is kind of core to their whole model of operation. Um, Michael, you were kind enough to have me on your show and you asked me a question that I want to now turn back around on you and get your thoughts uh -oh. on. <laughs> Why do you think that we see so many right-wing populist parties and leaders succeeding globally, but we really don't quite have an answer on the left at this point? 
Well, I think uh, three quick answers. Um, one, I think your point on my show was great, which is that it's easy to deliver right-wing populism because you don't actually have to deliver anything on economics or actual material well-being. Bolsonaro and Trump, as an example, that we've been talking about, pure one percent agendas. They're assaulting labor. They're stripping social protections. They are a net negative for all the 99 percent. Let's just use that uh, terminology. But they can give you a psychic payoff if you care about hearing the right, you know, uh, xenophobic, racist messaging or misogynist messaging or whatever it is. That they can deliver with no material cost. In fact, things like the, you know, uh, the ICE policies and voter suppression are a strategic benefit to the Republican Party. The second thing is I think that, you know, there's a huge divide inside you know, Western world between the left and the so-called center left, where you have a lot of people who, you know, represent still some type of Clinton and Blair vision of the world that are fundamentally not committed to addressing the underlying conditions. And so there's a fight inside what could be vehicles for pure left populism. And third, again, I think Lula being a political prisoner is important here. If you had someone who was the leader of Brazil who is a you know a really direct down to earth person? I think that is also like culturally important, and I think that's a very positive thing about Bernie actually. Like yeah. keep it simple, keep it direct, and let's actually solve problems in a way that is clear about what we're talking about, whether it be racism, but also building a real mass solidarity to restructure power in the society. So I think it's the conflict inside the center left and the center and the left, and I think it's the psychic payoff you talked about, and I think it's also maybe that there's been too many professionalized, white-collar, technocratic types that still generally run this parties, and they're totally allergic to simplicity and clarity. I mean, look at Kamala Harris's debt forgiveness plan. I mean, that is, it, it not only won't solve the problem, it's almost like convoluted for convoluted sake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so true. Thank you. Great for joining points, us, Michael. Michael. Thank you so much. Great to see you. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Next on Rising, we hear from a former white nationalist. He is going to share his journey downward and what brought him to eventually renounce hate and also the work that he's doing now. That when Rising continues.